اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا 
والنفس المطمئنة ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم وأهلك أداهم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم اللهم صل على فاطمة وبيها وبعلها وبنيها وسر المستودع فيها بعدد ما حانت به الملك We are going to recite hadith kasan jamian qurbatan lallah A'udhu billah min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim عن جابر ابن عبد الله الأنصاري عن فاطمة الزهراء عليه السلام بنت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله قال سمعت فاطمة أنها قالت دخل علي أبي رسول الله في بعض الأيام فقال السلام عليك يا فاطمة فقلت عليك السلام قال إني أجد في بدني ذوفا فقلت له أعيذك بالله يا أبتاه من الزوف فقال يا فاطمة أعيتيني بالكساء اليماني فغتيني به فتيته بالكساء اليماني فغيته به وسرت انظر اليه واذا وجهه يتلعلع كانه البال في ليله تمامه وكماله فما كانت إلا ساعة الميزة بولدي الحسن قد أقبل وقال السلام عليك يا أمة فقلت عليك السلام يا غرة عيني وثمرة فادي فقال يا أمة إني أشم عندك راية طيبة كأن راية جدي رسول الله فقلت نعم إن جدك تعت الكساء فقبل الحسن نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا جد يا رسول الله أتنزل لي أن أدخل معك تحت الكساء فقال عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا صاحب حوضي قد عذنت لك فدخل معه تحت الكساء فما كانت إلا ساعة وإذا بولدي الخسان قد أقبل وقال السلام عليك يا أمة فقلت عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا قرة عيني وثمرة فادي فقال لي يا أمة إني أشم إنك راعة طيبة كأنها رائحة جدي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله 
فقلت نعم ان جدك ما خاك تهت الكسان فدن الحسين نهم الكسان وقال السلام عليك يا جدا السلام عليك يا من اختاره الله اتازن لي ان اكون معكما تحت الكسان فقال عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا شاف امتي قد اذنت لك فدخل معهما تحت الكسان فاقبل ان ذلك ابو الحسن علي بن ابي طالب وقال السلام عليك يا بنت رسول الله وعليك السلام فقلت عليك السلام يا ابا الحسن ويا امير المؤمنين فقال يا فاطمة اني اشم انك راية طيبة كأن راية اخي وابن عمي رسول الله فقلت نعم ها هو ما ولديك تهت الكساء فاقبل علي نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا رسول الله اتعزل لي ان نكون معكم تحت الكساء قال له عليك السلام يا اخي ويا مسي وخليفتي وصاحب لبائي قد اذنت لك فدخل علي تحت الكساء ثم اتيت نحو الكساء وقلت السلام عليك يا ابتا يا رسول الله اتعزل لي ان اكون معكم تحت الكساء قال وعليك السلام يا بنتي ويا بزعتي قد عذنت لك فدخلت تحت الكساء فلما اكتملنا جميعا تحت الكساء أخذ بي رسول الله بترف الكساء وأومي بيده اليمنى إلى السماء وقال اللهم إن هؤلاء أهل بيتي وخاصتي وحمتي لهمهم لحمي ودمهم دمي يعلمني ما يعلمهم ويهزنني ما يهزنهم أنا حرب لمن حاربهم وسلم لمن صالمهم وعد لمن آداهم ومحب لمن حبهم إنهم مني وأنا منهم فاجعل صلواتك وبركاتك ورحمتك وغفرانك ورزوانك علي وعليهم واذهب عنهم الرجس وتهرهم تزهيرا فقال الله عز وجل يا ملائكتي ويا سكان السماوات اني ما خلقت سماعا مبنيا ولا ارضا مدهيا ولا غمنا منيرا ولا شمسا مزيا ولا فلكا يدور ولا بحرا يجري ولا فلك يسري الا في محبة اولى الخمسة الذين هم تحت الكساء فقال امين جبرائيل يا رب ومن تحت الكساء فقال عز وجل هم اهل بيت النبوة ومعدن الرسالة هم فاطمة وابوها 
و بلغا و بلغا فقال جبرائیل یارم اتزل لی نه به سهل لنز لکون و مهم ساد سا فقال الله نم قد عذنت لک فهبت العمین و جبرائیل و قال السلام علیک یا رسول الله العلی و لعلا یغروك السلام و یخصك بالتهیت و الاکرام و یقول لك و عزتی و جلالی انی ما خلقت سماعا مبنیا و لا ارضا مدهیا و لا غمرا منیرا و لا شمسا مذیعا و لا فلكا یدور و لا بهرا یجری و لا فلكا یسری الله لأجلكم و محبتكم و قد عذن لی ندخل مکم فالتعزن لی یا رسول الله فقال رسول الله و علیک السلام یا امین وقی الله انه نعم قد عذن تولک فدخل جبرائیل مغنا تحت الكسان فقال العبی ان الله قد عوى علیکم یقول انما یرید الله ليذهب عنكم الرجس اهل البيت ويطهركم تدهيرا فقال علي الله يا رسول الله اخب اخبرني ما لجلوس ناها تحت الكساء من الفضل عند الله فقال نبي والذي بعثني بالحق نبيا واستفاني بالرسالة نجيا ما ذكر خبرنا هذا في محفل من محافل أهل العرز وفيه جمع من شيعتنا ومحبينا إلا ونزلت عليهم الرحمة و حفظ مهم الملائکه و استغفرت لهم الى ان يتفرقو فقال علي اذن و الله فزنا و فاز شیعتنا و رب الكعبه فقال نبي ثانيا يا علي يا علي والذي بعثني بالحق نبيا واستفاني بالرسالة نجيا ما ذكر خبرنا هذا في محفل من محافل أهل العرض ففي جمع من شيعتنا ومحبينا وفي مهموم إلا وفرج الله حما ولا مغموم إلا وكشف الله غما ولا طالب حاجة إلا وقضى الله حاجة فقال علي نذن والله فزنا وسعدنا وكذلك شيعتنا فازوا وسعدوا في الدنيا والآخرة ورب الكعبة Wherever you are sitting, raise your hand, everyone together. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma in kull waliyika al-hujjat ibn al-Hassan. Salawatika alayhi wa ala abayin. في هذه الساعة وفي كل الساعة وليا وحفظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك تواه 
وتمتعه في آتبينا برحمتك يا رحم الراحمين آمين يا رب العالمين بر محمد وآل محمد صلوات Assalamu alaikum. Today I'm going to recite two short poems. The first is titled The first is titled Imam Hussein by H. Wells. Salawat. Pitched upon the scorching desert, the tent of Hussein lay. Encompassed round with Satan's hounds upon that black sad day. They numbered less than 80 strong, women and children too, while Yazid's thousands stood around, awaiting the fine's might. Driven away from the cooling stream, his children waiting for water, awaiting with patience extremely sublime, like sheep for the butcher's slaughter. Oh, how valiantly fought that pitiful few against Yazid's wild murderers fought with a courage unequaled in time, fought with a fierceness that was surely divine. The earth quaked and trembled as noon drew near. Still, the survivors knew no fear, but fewer grew that pitiful band. For Islam, God, and Hussein, they stand. At last, all were dead, the devil had won. Blood red sank down the merciless sun. Trampled and torn lay the gallant Hussein. For Islam, God and the faithful were slain. Salawat. The next poem will be a short one by Azra Marufi, named Water. When it rises, it's steam. When it falls, it's rain. Frozen in the clouds, hail. Frozen on the ground, snow. Dropping on a leaf, it's dew. Dripping from a flower, it's nectar. Falling from the eye, a tear. Flowing in the earth, a river. Trickling at the feet of Ismail, it's zamzam. Springing from the fingers of the prophet, Kotar. And when it is denied, it is Karbala. Salawat. ایک بلند تر سلوات اسلام علیکم ایوریون ایم گوئن تو ریسائٹ سم انگلیش پویٹری اباؤٹ حضرت علی ازغر سو پلیز ریسائٹ ای لاؤڈ سلوات Oh mother, I am so scared, where are you now? Please come to your sweet baby. Oh mother, I am so scared, where are you now? Please come to your sweet baby. From the grave of that dear baby, from the grave of that dear baby, comes a voice calling so dearly. Oh, mother, I am so scared. Where are you now? Please come to your sweet baby. I remember your hands.
cradling me closely, mother. Oh, holding me to your chest as you sang lullabies, mother. I'm burning in these hot sands. I am burning in these hot sands. Where are your loving soft hands? Oh, mother, I am so scared. Where are you now? Please come to your sweet baby. I remember the long burning thirst slowly killing me. Oh, your tears fell as your heart wrenched in pain in such agony. By the tenth, I had stopped moving. By the tenth, I had stopped moving till my father called upon me. Oh, mother, I am so scared. Where are you now? Please come to your sweet baby. I remember the warmth of Father as he carried. I remember the warmth of Father as he carried me, oh, to the soldiers to ask for water. This was his one plea. But they quenched my thirst within a... <laughs> <laughs> but they quenched my thirst with an arrow. But they quenched my thirst with an arrow. They broke your heart with that bow. Oh, mother, I am so scared. Where <laughs> Oh, mother, I am so scared. Where are you now? Please come to your sweet baby. Salawat. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for that beautiful recitation of Tilawat uh, Quran and Hadith Kisa, Brother uh, Hamid Raza. MashaAllah. And beautiful poetry recitations by, by Zamin and Jafar. MashaAllah. Um, <clears throat> so, just a reminder the uh, daily program for the uh, first Ashra of the uh, month of Muharram uh, starts uh, every evening around 6 30 p.m. Uh, with the recitation of Holy Quran, followed by Hadith -e Kissa, after which we have um, a few um, uh, selections of poetry. Um, then we proceed to the English speech by our guest speaker, Aunt Rul uh, Hujjat al Islam, Sayyid Mustafa Kazvini, uh, followed by Noha Matam, and then we break for Namaz and Maghriban around 8 30 p.m. The uh, second portion of the program is the Urdu program that starts at 9 p.m. with uh, So Salam Marcia, 
uh, followed by the speech in Urdu by our other guest scholar, uh, Hujjadul Islam, Dr. Sakhawat Hussain. And then we conclude the program with uh, Noha and Matamdari. Um, please also keep in mind that we have the ongoing uh, programs for the children, known as the Al-Maidi workshops. Um, the theme of the workshops this year is Lessons from Karbala. So these programs are taking place nightly. They'll run through uh, Saturday, August 6th. Uh, just a reminder, the programs start at 7 p.m. and they conclude at the uh, end of the English lecture. Uh, please keep in mind that uh, there are uh, three separate workshops. Uh, the first is for children uh, under uh, four years. Uh, the second workshop is for children uh, ages four to seven. And the third workshop is for children uh, 8 to 11 years old. Um, remember, these workshops are um, uh, don't require any registration, um, but space is limited, so it is first come, first serve. So please, you know, try to arrive um, on uh, on time. Um, the volunteers will appreciate that. Thank you very much. It's a great program. Please take advantage of it for those who haven't done it. The kids are really enjoying it, and we're hearing a lot of very good feedback. And mashallah, our volunteers are doing a great job with, with the children. Uh, the sponsors for tonight's program are the following families, Mr. Hussain and Mrs. Taira Ali, uh, Mr. Majid and Mrs. Sultana Musvi, Mr. Heather and Mrs. Urusa Ali, Mr. Mehdi and Mrs. Maroz Musvi, Dr. Sadiq and Mrs. Sara Ali Khan, Mr. Heather and Mrs. Fatima Rizvi, Mr. Sayed Abbas and Mrs. Habiba Ali, Dr. Asad and Dr. Huma Ali, Mr. Inayat and Mrs. Fatima Rangwala, Mrs. Shahana Kazmi, Mr. Hassan Kazmi, Mr. Samir and Mrs. Mariam Kazmi, as well as Mr. Imtiaz and Mrs. Uh, Fasia Kazmi. Kindly recite Surah Fatiha for the Marhumin of tonight's sponsors, as well as for all of our Marhumin and for those marhumin who have no one to recite Fatiha for them, Surah Fatiha. Just a reminder that the um, uh, opportunities for sponsorship of the nightly programs are still available. Um, there uh, is a need for sponsors for uh, tomorrow night's program, August 4th, as well as next week, August 9th, the 11th of Muharram. Um, if anyone is interested in taking advantage of opportunity to sponsor uh, these majalis, please reach out to myself or Brother Sharyar Heather or any of the volunteers here at the masjid. Um, if those nights are not uh, preferable for you, there are other nights that we can make ac accommodations for as well. There is also um, a, um, uh, a general uh, box for Moharam Fund that's uh, located at the desk outside, so donations there can be made as well as uh, online. Um, just a few quick housekeeping announcements. I won't make the uh, announcements too long so we can start the lecture on time. Um, there is um, a situation with the parking today. Unfortunately, there was some paving work that happened in the back. Um, so the space in the back is a little bit more limited tonight. Um, obviously, those who are here are here. But for those who may be listening and are arriving um, shortly or for the Urdu program, uh, please cooperate with the volunteers outside. Um, you can go to the back, but we'll have to have you park on the grass and please uh, try to um, avoid driving or walking on the wet asphalt that is out there. Please cooperate with the volunteers. They'll, they'll guide you so that you can come in and um, you know, join the program. Inshallah, by tomorrow, hopefully the situation will be resolved and we'll have you know, the full capacity in the back as well as we're making some arrangements um, to have overflow parking in the um, church across the street. We'll keep you updated on that as well. Um, a, a quick note on, on the seating for the ladies. Um, tonight, uh, ladies seating for the madlises are available up on the main level, right across uh, the masjid, as well as in the downstairs banquet hall. Um, tomorrow, please make note, ladies, that the uh, seating will be available only in the downstairs banquet hall. 
So please proceed downstairs for tomorrow's program. And then just a quick note on the, um, the Baruch distribution. So just to allow the volunteers uh, an opportunity to pray uh, their uh, Salat with the Jamaat, um, we're going to start the uh, distribution of the Baruch uh, after the English program, after the Salat. So please make note of that. That'll take place for the men's and the women's side. The distribution will take place uh, outside of the exits. Um, so um, I'll conclude my uh, announcements at this point so we can start the lecture. It is my distinct privileges, privilege, I should say, to invite um, to the podium uh, respected Hujat uh, al-Islam, Sayyid Mustafa Kazvini, to address tonight's gathering. For those sitting uh, in the middle, kindly if you can move forward a few steps to uh, make some room for those who are arriving uh, in the back. Thank you very much. Salawat. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala anbiya illahi jami'an wa ala sayyidihim wa khatamihim habibi ilahi al-alameen, abil qasim al-Mustafa Muhammad. وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز فوزا عظيما أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لن يصيبنا إلا ما كتب الله لنا هو مولانا وعلى الله فليتوكل المؤمنون صدق الله العلي العظيم There is an important question that goes in the minds of many people. And the question is, who designs, who plans, who programs my life for me? Who is in control of my life and my destiny? Are these things happening by accidents, by the nature? by themselves or there is predestination, pre-programming, pre-ordination if you will to all the events, all the movements of my life. Sometimes we wonder why I've taken this type of job, this type of profession, why I am married to this person, not that person? Who designed these things for me? Was it me, myself, completely, with my full of freedom? Or there was another power, another entity that was planning my life for me? Why tonight we are here? There are many other places, maybe more attractive physically, materialistically very attractive more comfortable more entertaining why we are sitting on the floor here listening to a lecture who made you come here and who made the person who is now dancing up and down in a nightclub somewhere who made him go there these things by accident do we decide them ourselves alone or there is partnership with someone else? Sometimes in one family, two siblings from one father and one mother, and I've seen this many times. Same house, same food, same environment, maybe same education too. 
One of them is res more responsible. One of them is pious, virtuous. The other one is irresponsible. The other one is corrupt. The other one does not respect his parents. Two siblings in one family. Who made one of them righteous and the other one corrupt? Is this their own mere choice or there is another element there? Very complicated questions, my friends. Take the day of Ashura. Amazing. Do you know that in the army who stood against Imam Hussein, there were some relatives of Imam Hussein in that army of Bani Umayyah related to Imam Hussein. Umar ibn Sa'd, the commander of the army of Bani Umayyah, was related to Imam Hussein through his son Ali al Akbar. Do you know that Shimr, who murdered Imam Hussein and beheaded him, do you know that he is related to Al Abbas ibn Ali alayhi salam? Shimr is related to Abbas. Shimr is, is from the family of Bani Kilab, the same family of Ummul Benin, the mother of Abbas alayhi salam and his three siblings. Do you know that? Why did they choose to stand in that army against Imam Hussein? They don't know him. They don't recognize him. They don't know any history about Imam Hussein. And on the other hand, there were some people who were until a few minutes ago, they were in that side, the side opposing Imam Hussein. You heard the story of Al Hur ibn Yazid al Riyahi, who was a military commander in the Umayyad army. He came to the side of Imam Hussein. Zuhair ibn al Qayn, one of the staunch Umayyad supporters, he met Imam Hussein. He tried to avoid Imam Hussein in these resting places from Mecca to Karbala. He was traveling to Iraq too. So whenever he knew that Imam Hussein is going to stay in this resting place, he would avoid it. He would stay in another one, either before or after, to avoid meeting Imam Hussein. Until he had to stay in one resting station, Imam Hussein sent him a messenger. He was eating with his wife in the, inside the tent. The messenger comes and he says, Imam Hussein wants to meet with you. He doesn't care. His wife said to him, listen, the grandson of the prophet is calling you and you don't care? Go, go see what he wants. His friends, they say he went, after a few minutes, he came with a different face, different gesture. He came, he said, my friends, I've been with you for a long time. Today, I'm going to leave you and join join my master Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam. He was from the Umayyad party. What made him? What made him? Was it his only cho personal choice? Only his personal choice? Or another decision standing with him, planning for him? Wahab was a Christian. On the way to Karbala, he was a Christian. He met Imam Hussein. On the journey to Karbala, he accepted Islam. His wife accepted Islam. His mother accepted Islam. On the day of Ashura, him and his wife gave their life, their blood for the sake of God. These things are accidents? Or th these things are pre-planned? And there are many questions, my friend. Many questions. Things happen in our life. Are they accident? Today I met someone in new, let, let's say. This is accident or pre-planned. There are three answers. In fact, three schools of thought, three different philosophical school that address this question. This question is very complicated, too complicated. This is a theological, philosophical question that many Muslim scholars and non-Muslim scholars have been discussing and debating for a long period of time. As a result, there were different branches of schools. Each one adopts one opinion. Come to the first school. The first school says, 
everything that happens in your life from A to Z, any movement, any action, any decision, whether big or small, it has been pre-planned for you strictly by divine decree and you have no role in it whatsoever. It has been chosen for you, planned for you in isolation from you. You have no control over it. So tonight, when you came here to this majlis, to the session, there was a power pushing you to go. You could not resist. Someone was pulling you to come here. Someone who's going someone bad, somewhere bad, is drinking right now. He had no choice in that. The same power was pushing him to go to that place. Everything in our, in our life has been preordained, pre-planned, predestined for us. And we have no say, we have no freedom, we have no free will. Furthermore, this school, which is called the school of compulsionist, or the school of determinism. Determinism means that any action, anything, any event that happens in our life, we do not decide it. We have no decision over it. There is another power, an external power. Those who are secular say external power. Those who are believers, they say God. God has control over it. You don't have any free will. You have to submit. Furthermore, they say that God from day one created people who are disbelievers, non-believers, rejecters, deniers, and nothing can bring them back to truth. And they have to go to hellfire. God created them from day one. They have no choice. Before their physical existence, God decided that this bunch of people here, they have to go to hellfire, no matter what they do in their life. They are distant, they are bound to hellfire. On the other hand, they argue that God created another group of people. He said, no matter what they do in this life, I don't, I'm not going to look at their record, their deeds, their actions, their behaviors. They are bound to heaven. I created heaven for them. So if there is someone who is a believer, then he is not. It's not because of him. It's not his choice. God wants him to be a believer. If someone is disbeliever, again, it's not his choice. God wants him to be a disbeliever. The mu'min has no control over his iman and faith. The non-mu'min, the criminal, the sinner, the disbeliever also has no control over his iman or his disbelief. This is their argument. And that school is known in the history of Islam. This school is about 1200 or 1300 years old. This is school, the school of Ash'arite, the school of Ash'arite, Ash'arism, Ash'a'ira, started during the time of Bani Umayyah and started to evolve slowly, slowly. And it was supported by the political establishment of the Umayyad and the Abbasid. Why? Because this school always justified the crime of the political establishment. And this idea of determinism or compulsion, mujabbira, this idea preceded Islam. Even the pagans before, pagans, idol worshippers, they believed in this idea that God wants me to worship idols. It's not about me. Wallahu amarana biha. Listen to this verse in the Quran, Surah Al-A'raf, verse 28. Wa fahishatan, when those pagan pagans idol worshippers, they commit a shameful act, fahisha, a shameful act, what do they say? Qalu wajadna abana alayha. We are doing exactly what our forefathers were doing. This is our tradition. And plus, wallahu amarana biha. God wants me, God forces me to do this. I have no choice. 
So if he's fornicating, if he's murdering, raping, drinking, committing mischief in the, la in the land, he attributes that to God as I have no freedom over it. God wants me to do this. Wallahu amalana biha. The answer comes from God. In qul inna Allah la ya'muru bil fahsha. You are wrong. This is a fallacy. God would never command or force any person to commit any shameful act. Do you attribute to God false things? False things? So this idea was very old. Preceded Islam. Pagans believed in it. Some people of the book, specifically the Jews during that time, they believed in it. And then it, it creeped into Islam. Slowly, slowly came into Islam. And it emerged during the time of Bani Umayyah and evolved during the time of Bani al-Abbas. And every caliph was supportive of this idea. Why? Because when Yazid was asked, why did you murder Imam Hussein? He said, it's not me. This is the predestination of God. This is exactly what he said to Imam Zain al-Abidin in Damascus. Yazid this is exactly what he said to Imam Ali ibn al Hussein Zain al Abidin in his courtyard in Damascus. He said, It was God, it wasn't me who murdered your father. This was the will of God. God murdered him, not me. Before him, his father Muawiyah, when he appointed his son as a crown prince, his son Yazid, many people rejected that. Many people in the Sunni establishment. One of them is Lady Aisha. She said, Muawiyah, this is not good. We could hardly recognize you as a ca caliph. Now you want your son Yazid, this corrupt person, licentious person to be a successor, Amir al muminin What did he say? He gave an answer, short answer. He said, this is the will of God. He attributes this to God. Jabr, determinism. This is the will of God, not mine. I have no role in it. Don't argue with me. Go and argue with God. So the political establishment until today, my friends, until today, if you're telling them, if you tell them, why do you bomb this country? Why do you have embargo on that country? Why do you torture? Why do you do this? Why do you kidnap someone and burn him alive? They say this is the will of God. We have no role in that. This is what God wants us to do. We are mujbareen. We have been coerced to do that. Many times when you have argument with their scholars, with their scholars, they say everything we do is by God's commands. Because God says, in, and they use the Quran, by the way, they use the Quran, but they, but they misinterpret the Quran. They say God says in his book, Wallahu khalaqakum wa ma ta'maloon. God created you and he created your deeds with you. But created your deeds does, did not mean God forced you to murder, to commit sin. <laughs> God gave you freedom of choice. Because anything happens in this life with his energy, with his permission. It's like a father who gives money to his son. The money is from the father. But the decision how to spend that money is with the son. If the son buys the drugs with that, he cannot say, this is my father. He does not blame his father. The father gave you the money, but he did not tell you buy drugs with it. He wants you to buy food. This is your decision. Don't blame it on your father. Bani Umayyah blamed every crime that they committed on God. On God. Okay? So this is the first group who believe that anything that happens in my life anything i have no control over it it has been premeditated pre-planned imposed upon me i come into this life and leave after 70 80 90 years without a freedom of choice without a free will i'm i'm an executor of god's will i'm like a machine a robot a robot i have no freedom of choice which is utterly wrong utterly wrong that compromises what God's justice 
if God creates someone and he says to him, hey, whatever you do, even if you go on a pray and go, and, and there are hadith, my friends, the time is limited. I can't bring the books to show you the hadith. One of these hadiths that attributed falsely to the Prophet, that if someone, God wants him to go to hellfire, if that person spends his entire life worshipping God, dedicating himself to God, doing everything righteously, God still can take him on the day of judgment to the hellfire. Because God is the king, the super king. And we cannot question God. And on the other hand, if someone spent his entire life in corruption, his entire life in facade, in destruction, God can take him to the paradise. It's up to him. Paradise and hellfire belongs to God. That does not make sense. God is the one who established justice. God is just. And God himself, he says, I'm not above the law. I establish justice. And I abide by justice. And I want you to follow justice. And I am your example for justice. God does not breach the law that he created. He doesn't do that. So this concept of fatalism or determinism or compulsion or job, this compromises the concept of what? Al-Adl al-Ilahi. The divine justice and by the way my friends 90% of the Muslims today who subscribe to other faiths they follow in their philosophy not in their fiqh in the fiqh they might follow Hanafi Hanbali Shafi'i or Maliki this is in jurisprudence but in philosophy 90% of them they follow the Ash'arite tradition and many of the people, they don't know who's who. They follow a scholar. They don't give themselves a chance. They do not even discuss. They do not debate. They don't have a free debates. They just follow blindly. In the school of Ahlul Bayt, I said, night first here, the first night, I said, please, 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 people. You have to debate. You have to ask. You have to question. It's not wrong to question anything, anything. Someone went to work in a Muslim country. He had just accepted Islam. So whenever he asks about any question, any question, any question, they tell him, don't ask, follow, follow. Aren't you Muslim? You became Muslim. Submit to God. Why do you ask? He says, no, I'm submitting to God. I'm just asking a question. I want to understand. They say, no, don't. Just follow blindly. Then he came to the Quran and he found a verse in the Quran in chapter number one, Surah Al-Baqarah, when God was informing the angels that he's about to create Adam. وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةٌ the angels who are supposed to strictly listen and obey, they had the freedom of asking God. They said, God, why do you create someone on earth? Someone who creates mischief on earth. So he said, God gave a freedom to angels to ask. And those guys in that country, they tell me, don't ask, just follow. This is not the religion of Islam. This is not the school of Ahlul Bayt. School of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim as -salam, we have to ask, we have to debate, we have to question, we have to understand. There is no blind following. No blind following. You have to ask. Encourage the young generation. When you don't give them the chance to ask and you shut them off, they leave religion. They go and find somewhere else. When we don't have religious freedom, intellectual freedom, we're going to use to lose our new generation. So you have to tell them why. Encourage your children to say why. Why? Why we are doing this? Why do we believe in this? What is the difference between this and that? 
You have to know the difference. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. As a result of this extremism with the Ash'arite, there was another school that came that opposed the Ash'arite as a reaction to them. And they believed in absolute, absolute and extreme free will. They argued that what Ash'arite and compulsionists are saying doesn't make sense. Does not make sense at all. God is not going to coerce you against your will. God is not going to take someone who is a good worshiper, good person, would take, him, would take him to hellfire. He wouldn't do that. So as a result, as a result, as a reaction, they believed in complete and absolute free will. What did they say? They, and those schools are called what? Huh? Huh? Republican or Democrat? No, Mu'tazila, Mu'tazila, Mu'tazilite. Mu'tazilite and their leader is Amr ibn Ubaid, Wawasil ibn Ata, again in the third century Hijri. So those people, they said, God is going to create us. But after the creation, he has no intervention in our life. He will just throw us into this earth. And he says, listen, guys, I've given you books. I'm sending messengers. And I'm leaving you by yourself. That's it. Next time I'm going to meet you is on the day of judgment. I'm not going to intervene in your life. Is this good idea or bad? What do you think? Huh? Bad idea. Why? Because God is the creator, the sustainer, the cherisher. God is with you. God does not leave you. وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَمَا كُنْتُمْ Wherever you go, 24-7, God is with you. وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ وَنَعْلَمُ مَا تُوَسْوِسُ بِهِ نَفْسُهُ وَنَحْنُ And we are أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ We are closer to you than your jugular vein. Have you seen a mother one day, a mother who delivers a baby? And then she throws the baby away and she says to the baby, baby, you take care of yourself, you know. I'm, I meet you after 50 years, when you are old, when you are grown. She doesn't do that. She takes care of her baby 24-7. God has a direct involvement in our life. Every single day. Every single day. So what the Mu'tazilite said, they said God does not intervene. But this is wrong. Because this is going to compromise what concept? Which concept? The concept of monotheism, tawheed. When you say God has no role in my life. He left me alone. He doesn't leave you alone. God is with you. And you need him every second of your life. God says, Lahu maqalidu samawati wal earth. God is in control of, of heaven and earth. In the first verse that I started this chapter, this, this uh, lecture, chapter 9, Surah At-Tawbah, verse 51. قُلْ لَنْ يُصِيبَنَا O Prophet Muhammad, say to your community, قُلْ لَنْ يُصِيبَنَا إِلَّا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَنَا Nothing is going to struck us except what God has decreed for us. Anything that happens in your life is with His permission. With his involvement, with his agreement. He has a direct involvement. Today, parents do not leave their kids alone. Have you seen parents abandoning their kids? They just bring them into this life and then you abandon them? What do you say about those parents? The least thing you say, they are irresponsible. They are not good parents, bad parents. So do you think God will bring me into this life? And he says, take care of yourself. God says to the prophets, I am following you. I am with you. I'm not going to leave you alone. So that is the second group. The group of Mu'tazilite. Another extreme. Another extreme. Ash'arites were one form of extreme on the right. Those guys, Mu'tazilites, on the left. Another extreme. Both schools do not work. Neither the school that says only God determines your future. Nor the school that says only you who determine your future, not God. 
God leaves you alone. Both are wrong. We come to the school of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. Listen to what Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam says. Imam al-Sadiq says, when it comes to predestination, coercion, or free will, he says, la jabra, there is no absolute coercion by God, no absolute force by God, wala tafweel, nor absolute free will. Walakin, the fact of the matter, walakin amrun bayna amrain, you are in the middle. Imam al-Sadiq says there is collaboration between you and God when it comes to your life, to events of your life from A to Z. There is coordination, collaboration between you and God. I avoid saying partnership because if I say partnership, people will say, huh, the Shia, they say God has partners. God has no sharik, no partner. So I avoid that. This is critical. I use instead collaboration, coordination between us and God. We work together. Human beings work in conjunction with God. We both decide our fate. We both decide our journey. Now, does that apply to everything, all instances? No, to many of them. But to few of them, still we have no say over them. Such as what? Such as sickness. Someone is diagnosed with cancer. He gets a treatment, all sorts of treatments, okay? He does dua, prayers, his entire family, his entire community. God wants him to go. For a reason. There is a reason. We might not understand the reason why this person has to go. If you go to chapter 18, Surah Al Kahf, here, there are three amazing stories. Of Musa and Khidr. Khidr would go and slay a person, boy, nice boy, playing with other kids. He slays him. And, 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 and Musa goes nuts. He starts screaming. This is a little boy. Why do you kill him? He says, wait, wait. I will let you know. There is a reason. There is a wisdom in that. You only see the negative side. You don't see the positive side. This life has negative and positive side. Negative and positive. Sometimes we don't see the positive. We see death as negative. Disease as only negative. Poverty as being negative. Loneliness, being alone, having no family, negative. Divorce, negative. Sometimes they are positive. God knows the reason. We don't know the reason. We don't understand it. But in most of our events, in our life, most of these events, we work in collaboration with God. Meaning, God is the one who plans for us, but in no isolation from us. God looks at our potentials, our capacity, our worth, our niyyah, your heart, your deed, your deed, your worthiness, expediency. This is why we have Laylatul Qadr. The night of destiny. We call it the night of destiny. Because God, during that night, He looks at you. He examines your heart, your intention, your capacity. And He gives you according to your own capacity and according to your credential and according to what you deserve. Whatever you deserve, He's going to give you. It's like a father. I know many fathers, they have lots of money. But when it comes... When it comes to teach their children, to discipline them, to teach them manner, they don't give the entire money to the kids. They tell them, listen, I have billions of dollars, but I want you to learn this. Because if I give you lots of money, you are not going to appreciate that. You're going to waste this money. So I'm going to give you according to your need. And I know your need. You are my son. You are my daughter. I am going to not let you starve. Giving you what you deserve. This is exactly what God does for us. God says, if some people, If some people, I give them more, more than what they deserve, 
They're going to commit mischief in the land. They're going to be tyrants. They are not going to come here and sit in the majlis. They're going to go to Las Vegas and spend that money there. Story of the man who was with the Prophet. Thalaba. His story is mentioned in chapter 9. He attends five daily prayers in the first, first line behind the Prophet. One day he said to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, I have nothing. So ask God to give me. I need money. The Prophet said, you have everything. You have a Prophet Muhammad here. You are rich. But he insisted. He insisted. He insisted that I need money. So the Prophet raised his hand. Allahumma rzuq thalaba. His name is Thalab. Oh God, bestow out of your bounties, your gifts, your wealth on him. He had one sheep. It became two, three, four, five. He used to attend five daily prayers. When your business grows, do you still have time to come to the mosque? Huh? He would skip one prayer, two prayers, three prayers. And then he would skip sometimes the whole day he doesn't show up. When he comes the following day, the Prophet says, Thalib, he says, Ya Rasulullah, business, you know, business is booming. I have to stand there, you know, business. I have family, I have kids. And then he would show up only on a Fridays. And then after that, the more, the more money he got, the more his business got bigger, he did not come. He did not show up. He abandoned, he abandoned the prayers. When the zakat came, God said to the Prophet, go and approach them and receive zakat. The Prophet sent messengers to him to get the zakat. He said, zakat? This is taxation. Too much taxation. Why should I pay? He refused to pay. His story is mentioned in chapter 9. Sometimes God knows why he doesn't give. Don't insist. Always, my friends, in dua, in your dua, always ask, say this sentence. وَلَا حَاجَةً مِنْ حَوَائِجِ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ لَكَ فِيهَا رِضًا وَلِيَ فِيهَا خَيْرٌ وَصَلَاحٌ Oh Allah, if this need that I am asking you, you are okay with it, you are happy with it, and it is good for me, for my akhirah, make it happen. If not, don't. Don't. Don't answer my prayers. In chapter 17, God says, sometimes we, we the people, out of desperation, out of desperation, وَيَدْعُ الْإِنسَانُ بِالشَّرِّ دُعَاءَهُ بِالْخَيْرِ Man, out of desperation, out of unawareness, being naive, being desperate, he starts praying to Allah for things that are detrimental for him. Detrimental, dangerous for him. وَيَدْعُ الْإِنسَانُ بِالشَّرْ دُعَاءَهُ بِالْخَيْرِ وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ Why he does this? وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ عَجُولًا He's haste in haste. He's hastily. He's hastily. He doesn't have patience. Always ask God. Always. Always. You have to ask God. By the way, God is planning your life. But God wants you to ask Him. Not only on the nights of Qadr. Every night is a holy night. Every night the gates of the heaven are open. Every night, anytime, when you go to God. Pray for your health, even if you are healthy. Pray for your richness, and the money that you have, you dispose it for your goodness and the goodness of your community. So you can purchase a plot with it in the Akhirah, not just here in this life. Pray for success at school. Pray if you are still single to find the best partner, the partner that gets you closer to God. Pray for your children to have. This is one of my favorite prayers. Rabbi habli min ladunka dhurriyatan tayyibatan inna ka sami'u dua O Lord, merciful Lord, bestow upon me good progeny, not any progeny, not any children, quality children. Dhurriyatan tayyibah. If they are not tayyibah, if they are evil, they will destroy my life and their lives and the community. One person who is tayyib and lawful and good and responsible is better than a 20 who are irresponsible. So pray and keep praying and ask. Imam Hussein when we look at his movement, 
Who did choose? Who chose Ashura for him? God or him himself? Who? Huh? Both. Both. Imam Hussein himself says, When he was about to leave Medina, many people came to him. Some of the wives of the Prophet, such as Um Salama, Abdullah ibn Abbas, many others, O oh, Aba Abdullah, please don't go to Karbala. That is a dangerous area. Please don't take your family. What did he say? He said one sentence. Inna Allah shā'a an yarani qatila. God, the decree, the will of God is that I get martyred on the plains of Karbala. So God wanted him to go, but did he accept or reject? With his acceptance, with his love, with his conviction. Whatever God decides for us, we don't say no. We follow. We follow with love. Imam Hussein was smiling at the time of his martyrdom. He was not worried about himself. In fact, he was happy. The companions of Imam Hussein on the eve of Ashura were shaking hands with each other, congratulating each other. Some of them, they cracked jokes. So some of them said, why do you crack a joke tonight? He said, because a few hours until the morning were we going to find our way to paradise. Of course I am happy. I am excited about this journey. They were not forced to do that out of their free will. So in conjunction with God, coordination with God, both, both God planned and the servant accepted and he was willing to go. This is why, my friends, the power of dua comes. Do not underestimate the power of dua. Dua is going to change your life. Dua is going to create miracles. Not far from here, only 30 minutes from here, there is a man that I met him. I don't mention his name. Some of you here know him. I met him over 20 years ago. He hated the Shia Muslims. He hated them. He did not tolerate to see a single Shia. He said, I went to Hajj. I stood before the house of God. It was morning. I prayed to Raqqa. And I said, oh God, this is exactly what he said, and he's a truthful. This is a true statement. This man speaks the truth. He doesn't lie. I know him. He said, oh God, if the path that I am following is correct, keep me strong on this path. If this path that I am following is wrong, please, God, don't allow me to leave this city of Mecca before you change me, change my direction. He says, by Allah, I have not finished my sentence. Someone tap on my shoulder from behind. He said, I got angry. I said, leave me alone. I am praying. He said, no, I have a question. I have a question. Where are you from? He said, I'm from Egypt. What do you want from me? Where are you from? The guy told me I'm from Iran. So he says, I said to him, oh, you are Iranian, you are Shia, you hit yourself in Ashura, you have a, another Quran, you, 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 you curse the Sahaba, you do this, you do this. The man said, listen, 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 I'm not a scholar, I'm an engineer. My job is an engineer and I came for Hajj. So if you want answers, we have a scholars here. I can take you to my scholars. He said, yeah, okay. Let me go to your scholars. He said, I was angry at him, frustrated. He says, we left Masjid al-Haram. He took me to a building. He took me to the elevator. There is a room. Inside that room, there were several scholars sitting. He said, I went there with arrogance. I, I, want, I went there to defy them, to prove that they are wrong, and I am right. But they welcomed me. They welcomed me with a smile. They welcomed me with a smile. The power of a smile. 
This is what I spoke about. You can turn an enemy instantly into a friend. God has given you this power, this ability. Use it. Use it with your family. Use it with your friends, with your neighbors. Use it with your enemies too. So they welcomed me with open arms. They said, how can we help you? So I had a barrage of questions. You know all these misconceptions about Shia Muslims. Why do you believe Muhammad is the prophet? Why, why do you believe Muhammad is not the prophet? Ali is the prophet. Where is your true Quran? Give me your true Quran. Why do you curse the Sahaba? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? They said, okay, sit down, sit down, relax. Have a cup of tea. He says, the meeting started in the morning. We only stopped for prayers. They invited me for lunch and dinner. I refused to eat. Only for the prayers. We pray, we go back to the debate. From morning till midnight. Till midnight. He said that day I did not eat anything. I was asking them. They were answering me. They were showing me the books. Look at this. Look at the answer in your books. He said by midnight... I realized that God had answered my prayers. But he said, I was so arrogant, I did not tell them that I concede the defeat. I didn't tell them. I told them, listen, the books that you have, give them to me. Give me these books. I'll take them to my apartment. Maybe God is going to make out of that an abundance of goodness. They said, no, these books are precious. We cannot give you these books. I insisted. They said, oh, okay, three days. You take these books, three days, and you bring them back. He says, I took the books to my apartment. I didn't go to Masjid al-Haram anymore. I left the tawaf, the ziyara. I stayed in my apartment reading these books. After three days, I brought the books back to them. And I felt that the change took place. And from that day, I started saying, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah, wa ashhadu anna aliyan waliullah. The man is only 30 minutes from here. One of the most successful preachers, scholars of the school of Ahlul Bayt. This happened when he was 40 years old. 40 years old. And I have many stories like that. And amongst you now, there are people who are sitting here, they have similar stories. Similar stories. This happens when you pray sincerely. When you are sincere, your dua is sincere. Do you see the MCs every night before I come to the podium, they recite, Amman Yujibul Muftar? Huh? Do you hear that? Amman Yujibul Muftar. It means, oh God, who only listens and answers those who are in distress. Not someone who's sitting and relaxed and he sends his prayers. No, someone is distressed. Is distressed. He has no solution. He wants God to listen to him. He's a drowning. He's a drowning. This is the condition you have to have when you pray. You have to be serious and God will answer your prayers. Before we conclude, one more thing, my friends, a question that many of our youngsters ask. Let's address this question tonight, and then we go to Aun and Muhammad, the two sons of Lady Zainab, salam. This question is, and of course we're going to have, inshallah, a Q&A on the 11th of Muharram, one day after Ashura, which is Tuesday night, we're going to have uh, the whole session will be a Q&A. So if you have any questions, prepare them for that night, inshallah. Men and women, both, inshallah. The question is, if God, his knowledge is eternal, God is omniscient, omnipresent. God knows about our journey in this life from the beginning where it has no beginning to the end where it has no end. He knows everything. He knows every second of your life, even before you come into this life. Before you come into this life, God knows about you. And he knows some people are sinners 
or criminals, ruthless, then why did he create them? He knows these people are ruthless, criminal, and sinner. Why did he create them? Did he create them to give, to give us more troubles, more problems in this life? What is the answer? Three answers. A. This life is based on two elements. And they have to be there. The element of khair and the element of shar. The element of goodness and the element of evil. We would never appreciate khair or goodness if we don't see the evil. We don't appreciate it. We will take life for granted. We don't appreciate the light if we don't see the darkness. We don't appreciate health if we do not experience illness. We do not appreciate food and shelter if we do not experience starvation. We do not appreciate knowledge if we don't experience some areas and some people with ignorance. Okay? If we, we do not appreciate peace and tranquility if we do not go through war. We do not appreciate democracy if we do not experience dictatorship. We do not appreciate Muhammad and Ali and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein if God did not create Muawiyah, Yazid and Abu Sufyan. If he does not create them, how do you know if Muhammad is pure? How do you know Imam Ali is pure? You have to compare them with others. Otherwise, we will take them for granted. So this system is based on these two elements. God creates evil for a purpose, for a reason. But at the same time, he will equip us with the power of resistance to resist that evil. To resist it. Not to succumb to it. He does not want me to succumb to it. God created Satan. The job of Satan is temptation. Temptating. Temptation. Seduction. But God at the same time equips me with the power to resist Satan, to resist him. If I have piety, I can. God says in the Quran, Inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim sultan. Those who are close to me are connected. They have good Wi-Fi system with me. You cannot have control over them. You cannot reach them. So he gives me at the same time. He gives me the power of resistance. So this is number one. Number two, if God is not supposed to create some people because they are sinners, then he should never create any person because all of us are sinners, except the ma'sumin in this universe. Who is not a sinner? Who is not guilty? Who has not violated God's rules? Every single day we commit sins. Every single morning, every single evening. There are only ma'sumin. A number of men and one lady, Fatima to Zahra salam, who are infallible. And those people, God bestowed upon them this extra layer of protection. Otherwise, even those, if God does not give them this extra layer of protection, they would commit a sin. But it is the grace of God, the protection of God. See what Musa alayhi salam says in this book. Sorry, Yusuf alayhi salam. Yusuf, during the ordeal with Zulaikha, he says, O oh God, تصرف عني كيدهن, If you do not intervene yourself and bestow this extra layer of a protection on me and hold me back, أصبو إليهن, I would lose myself and succumb to them. وأكن من الجاهلين, I would commit the sin, but it was you. You hold me back. Through Isma, the concept of Isma. So if God does not create sinners, the earth will be empty. And there is no reason for him to create the universe. The earth will be empty. But God created us. And God knows we are sinners. God knows we commit a sin. Despite us committing a sin, God is willing to receive us with open arms. God is willing to forgive us. Do not give up on God. 
You may give up anything on this universe except God. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, He said to his companions, if a sinner who spent his entire life sinning one year before death decides to seek forgiveness and repent, God will accept his repentance. Then the Prophet said, Inna sanata la kathir, one year is too much. One month before his death, he decides to repent, God would still accept his repentance. Then the Prophet said, one month is too much, one week before his death. If he decides sincerely to repent and go back to God, God would still accept his repentance. Then the Prophet said, one week is too much, one day, 24 hours before his death, he decides genuinely to go back to God, still God would accept his repentance and forgive him. Then he says, 24 hours is too much. If he decides to repent before his soul reaches here, he pointed here to his throat. The soul exits the body from this point. Before the soul reaches here, still God. This means five minutes before his death. Five minutes. Still God would accept his repentance and will forgive him. God is generous. And Imam Hussein is the gate of mercy. Ya Baba, ar rahma Imam Hussein is the gate of mercy. Don't forget tonight, these nights when you come, while you are praying for the dunya, for a good business, good health, good house, good car, good partner, good son, good daughter, also pray for repentance. Oh God, keep me on the path of Hussein. Oh God, forgive my sins. Oh God, if, have, if I have done wrongdoing, injustice, offending my friends, my family members. Allow me to have the courage, the guts to go to them and say, sorry, I'm sorry, I apologize. This is the season, season of mercy. Why? Because all of your hearts are tender during these 10 nights. When you cry, don't underestimate the drop of tears. This drop of tears can extinguish oceans of God's anger, oceans of God's anger. Don't underestimate it. So ask for tawbah, ask for repentance. The Quran says, Ya ibadi al asrafu, O my servants who made excessiveness of sins, not one or two or ten or twenty or a hundred or two hundred, excessiveness of sins, excessiveness. La tayasu, do not give up, do not be despondent on God's mercy. Inna Allah, verily God, He's willing to drop all the charges against you and forgive you. You need wasila, means, and this wasila is Abu Abdullah al Hussein, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Tonight, attributed to two boys, Aun and Muhammad. Those are the children of Lady Zainab alayhi salam. Their father is Ja'far, Abdullah ibn Ja'far. Abdullah ibn Ja'far is the first cousin of Imam Hussein and first cousin of Lady Zainab. His father is Ja'far. Ja'far ibn Abi Talib was murdered in the Battle of Mu'tah on the northern boundaries of the Arabian Peninsula. Today it's in Jordan. And the Prophet cried for him. So his son, Abdullah, married to Lady Zainab. Imam Hussein asked the husband, which is Abdullah ibn Ja'far, to stay in Medina. He was alive at the time of Ashura. But Imam Hussein requested him to stand, to stay in Medina, to keep Bani Hashim united there. They needed strong men. And one of them was Abdullah ibn Ja'far. So he didn't want him to come with him to Karbala. But he gave his blessings and his permission and his encouragement to his sons to go to Karbala. So Aun and Muhammad came to Karbala on the day of Ashura when the battle broke. Lady Zainab was standing, was standing there and watching the bodies of Bani Hashim being brought from the battlefield to the makeshift camp. Whenever someone from Bani Hashim would come 
she would go to receive him. She came to her children, Aun and Muhammad. She said to them, why are you sitting here? Why don't you go and defend your uncle Hussein? They said to her, Mama, we went to him since the morning. We begged him for permission, but he refused. He refused. He's reluctant to give us permission. He said, I don't allow you to go to the battlefield. So if you can help us by going and telling Uncle Hussein to give us permission to go. Lady Zainab came and stood before her brother Hussein. She said to him, Habibi Hussein, my sweetheart Hussein, you know, after the death of our mother Fatima, though I am younger than you two years, but I was a, like a mother to you. I protected you. I took care of you. I was always worried about you. I never left you alone at all until today, Karbala. And if you give me permission, I will go to the battlefield and I will defend you with my soul and blood. Now, please, I want you to give permission to my two children, Aun and Muhammad, to go and fight and defend Islam. Here, under the pressure, Imam Hussein alayhi salam said, yes, my sister Zainab, yes, my sweetheart Zainab, I will give them permission, but I am sad for them and sad for you. She said, no, don't be sad. Don't be sad. I'm happy. I'm happy that I'm giving my two sons to defend Islam. So when they went to the battlefield after seeking permission, they were fighting courageously until their energy depleted. Whenever one of them was being attacked by Ubayyad army, he would seek aid and help from his brother. When they attacked Aun, Aun would call upon Muhammad to come to his aid. When they attack Muhammad, Muhammad will call upon his brother Aun to come to his aid until both of them were encircled by the army. Here, when they could not fight anymore and the Umayyad army attacked them with their arrows, with their swords and daggers, here they called upon their uncle Hussein. Oh, Amma, alayka minni salam. Alayka minna salam, ya Aba Abdullah. Now we need you to come to our aid. By the time Imam Hussein rushed to them, they were fallen. He carried them, he brought them. Everyone who falls down, Imam Hussein would carry him, would carry him himself, except one. I'm going to tell you who that one is in two nights from now. So he carried them to the makeshift camp. The, the lady Zainab, with every shaheed, she would go to receive him. Shaheed from Bani Hashim, of course, from her family. When Qasim was brought and his brothers, she went to receive them. When Ali al-Akbar and his brothers, when Al-Aqil, Al-Talib, any one of them will be brought, she will come and receive them. But when her two sons came, she was too shy to go. Out of respect for Imam Hussein, she did not go to receive her two sons. Inna lillah wa inna raj'un. Another young man who lost his father. He was very young. His mother asked him to go and fight. She gave him the sword. He came, he stood before Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Imam Hussein said, this father, this son lost his father. I am not going to bring two tragedies upon his mother in one day. So he said to him, uncle, go back home. Go back home to your mother. He said, umma, uh, amma, ummi hiya allati arsalatni. It was my mother who asked me to come here and fight. He sent him back. He came back to his mother. His mother holds his hand and she takes him back to Imam Hussein. She says, Ya Aba Abdullah, Atuthkalu Ummu Kazahra bi waladiha, Wala Uthkalu bi waladi. Is it okay? Is it fair that your mother Fatima is going to be bereft of you, afflicted with you, and you don't want me to lose my son, be afflicted with my son? Please allow my son to fight. Imam Hussein gave him permission. He took off to the battlefield, Amiri Hussein wa Ni'mal Amir. Sururu Fuadil Bashir al Nadir. My master, my leader is Imam Hussein. I'm proud of him. He is the son of Ali and Fatima. He has no match, no similarity. While he was fighting courageously, he received a fatal blow. He fell down. His mother rushed into him. She wipes the blood from his forehead. 
She says, Ahsanta ya bunay, ya surura aini wa qurrata fuadi. Good job, my son. You are going to paradise. And then she fetched the tent pole. She went into the middle of the battlefield. Ana ajuzu sayyidi za'ifa. Khawiyatun baliyatun nahifa. Though I am a trail, though I am weak, I am exhausted, but I am determined to defend the family of Fatima to Zahra, the son of Fatima to Zahra. Imam Hussein came to her. He said to her, Amat Allah, kutib al qatl wal qital wa alayna wa ala al muhsanat jarru al dhiyuli. You don't have to fight. The fighting is the job of the soldiers and the men here. You have to take care of women. She sent her back to the tent. But he asked his son Ali al-Akbar to go and save her son. By the time Ali al-Akbar reached him, he saw this young boy saying, Sayyidi, hawilu rahla ummi ila rihalikum. Innaha asbahat min ba'di gharib. Oh, my master Ali al-Akbar, please consider my mother to be your family. Please take her into your side. Take her to your aunt, Lady Zainab, because she is going to remain lonely after me. Alone, you have to take care of her. He said to him, Rest assured, of course, I am going to take care of your mother. Inna lillah. وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ وَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَيَّ مُنْقَلَبٍ يَنْقَلِبُونَ وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله هو الله بستو health prosperity guidance on all of us إن شاء الله accept our أعمال hasten the reappearance of our imam وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات ثواب الفاتحة مع الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد Hussein. Ya Hussein. This Latmiya is about the prayer of Imam Hussein on Ashura. Please repeat the chorus after me. Hayya ala al Aza, hasten to the Aza of Imam Hussein. Qad qamat al Salah. It's time to establish prayer. Ya Ummun al Hussein, our Imam in prayer is Hussein. Was Salah bi Karbala, and the Salah is in Karbala. As you recite with me, try to imagine yourself behind Imam Hussein in Karbala praying. Hayya ala al Aza, qad qamat al Salah. Hayya ala al Aza, qad qamat al Salah. يا أمنا الحسين والصلاة بكربلا يا أمنا الحسين والصلاة بكربلا حي على العزاء قد قامت الصلاة حي على العزاء قد قامت الصلاة يا أمنا الحسين والصلاة بكربلا يا أمنا الحسين والصلاة بكربلا في كربلاء هذا علي بن الحسين الأكبر في كربلاء بين المصلين غدا يكبر في كربلاء لا تخفت الآيات لا بل اجهروا في كربلاء صوت الصلاة للطغاة يقهر حي على الفلاح في ساحة الكفاح حي على الفلاح 
في ساحة الكفاح توضأوا في الحرب من دوامة الدماء توضأوا في الحرب من دوامة الدماء حي على ال... قد قامت الصلاة حي على العزاء قد قامت الصلاة يا أمنا الحسين والصلاة بكربلاء يا أمنا ال... والصلاة بكربلاء يا مسلمون قوموا ولبوا داعي الله معي يا مسلمون تيمموا الآن بحمر الأدمع يا مسلمون هذا حسين بذل تلك الشرع يا مسلمون يدعو ألا أيا نفس لا لن تخضعي أين الأبات أين هذا هو الحسين أين الأبات أين هذا هو الحسين يدعو هلم ونسحق الجيوش بالدعاء يدعو هلم ونسحق الجيوش بالدعاء حي على ال... قد قامت الصلاة حي على العزاء قد قامت الصلاة يا أمنا الحسين والصلاة بكربلاء يا أمنا الحسين والصلاة بكربلاء سووا الصفوف حتى نصد في الدماء تلك السيوف سووا الصفوف سبعون في الله سنسحق الألوف سووا الصفوف هذه صلاة الحق ترغم الأنوف سووا الصفوف عشور ذا وها هنا أرض الطفوف نشهد أننا نهوى حسيننا نشهد أننا نهوى حسيننا نفديه بالأرواح والأجساد والدماء نفديه بالأرواح والأجساد والدماء حي على العزاء حي على العزاء قد قامت الصلاة يا أمنا الحسين والصلاة بكربلاء يا أمنا الحسين والصلاة بكربلاء مع الحسين نفدي دماؤنا ونبذل النفوس مع الحسين لن تنحني لظالم من الرؤوس مع الحسين فوق الرماح السمر والبيض ندوس مع الحسين إنا بحرب الطف لا حرب البسوس إن جاءنا يزيد والله من جديد إن جاءنا يزيد والله من جديد نعيد يوم الطف في معاقل الإباء نعيد يوم الطف في معاقل الإباء حي على العزاء قد قامت الصلاة عزاء قد قامت الصلاة يا أمنا الحسين والصلاة بكربلاء يا أمنا الحسين والصلاة بكربلاء هاك الدماء يا كعبة الأحرار يا رمز الإباء هاك الدماء نفديك يا مولا يا أما وأبا هاك الدماء بالعيش ذلا إننا لن نرغبا هاك الدماء نحن نصلي فوق هامات الضباء حي على الخلود الظلم لن يسود حي على الخلود الظلم لن يسود ما دام يعلو في الوغى من جرحك النداء ما دام يعلو في الوغى من جرحك النداء حي على العزاء حي على قد قامت الصلاة يا أمنا الحسين والصلاة بكربلاء يا أمنا الحسين والصلاة بكربلاء حتى الممات لم يترك الحسين فرض الله بان حتى الممات يدعو ألا حي على خير العمل حتى الممات نبقى مع الحسين لن نرضى بدل حتى الممات 
وإذ علت رؤوسنا فوق الأسال لن نرهب الطغاة نبقى مع الحياة لن نرغب لن نرهب الطغاة نبقى مدى الحياة ما خاب من سار بدرب كعبة الوفا ما خاب من دار بدرب كعبة الوفا حي على العزاء قد قامت الصلاة حي على العزاء قد قامت الصلاة يا أمنا الحسين والصلاة بكربلا يا أمنا الحسين والصلاة بكربلا جزاكم الله خير صلوات لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا حسين يا حسين إن الله وملائك يا حسين يا حسين يا حسين يا حسين يا حسين 